Welcome to part three in our lecture series about glycogen biosynthesis and metabolism. In the previous sections, we've discussed insulin signaling and the process of building glycogen, glycogenesis, in detail. Now let's take a look at the other side of the homeostatic balance, glucagon signaling. During hypoglycemia, or low blood glucose levels, pancreatic alpha cells release the hormone peptide glucagon, which stimulates gluconeogenesis, the formation of glucose, and glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen, in the liver, resulting in the release of glucose to the plasma, raising blood glucose levels. Let's review a few terms before we begin. In the last section, we were introduced to glycogenesis, or the synthesis of glycogen. We saw that this pathway was activated during insulin signaling. In glucagon signaling, this pathway is inhibited, and the opposite pathway, glycogenolysis, is activated. Glucagon signaling in the liver glycolysis, the utilization of glucose for energy production. As the liver is trying to use glucose to maintain blood glucose levels, it doesn't utilize it for its own energy needs during this time. Instead, lipids can be used by liver cells to generate ATP energy. And in fact, glucagon signaling increases lipolysis or the breakdown of lipids. Finally, glucagon also upregulates the process of gluconeogenesis, or the generation of glucose from non-sugar metabolites. We will address the mechanisms of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis in later chapters. Here, we will only take a cursory look at these pathways and will focus more on the process of glycogenolysis. Glucagon signaling begins when the hormone binds to its receptor on the liver cells. Glucagon receptors are not widespread within the body like insulin receptors have evolved. Since the purpose of this hormone is to cause the release of glucose back into the bloodstream, this process is highly controlled and only the liver can deliver glucose back into the bloodstream to maintain homeostasis. Thus, other target tissues such as skeletal muscle do not need to have these receptors expressed and are not sensitive to glucagon signaling. The glucagon receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor and is also referred to as 7TM receptor as it contains seven transmembrane domains that span the plasma membrane. This family of receptors is widespread throughout the body and is responsible for many of the pharmaceutical mechanisms of action seen in our treatment of different disease conditions. With regards to this pathway, once glucagon binds to the receptor, the receptor moves laterally in the plasma membrane and binds with the G protein that is stationed as a peripheral protein to the plasma membrane. The G protein contains three major domains, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma domain. The alpha domain is capable of binding to the GDP, GTP cofactors. When the G protein is inactive, all three subunits stay together, and the alpha subunit remains inactive and bound to GDP. When G protein associates with an activated receptor, the alpha subunit exchanges GTP for the bound GDP cofactor and the gamma and beta subunits dissociate. The activated alpha subunit moves laterally on the periphery of the plasma membrane until it contacts adenylyl cyclase. The enzyme is also called adenylate cyclase. This activates the adenylyl cyclase that converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP production is an amplification step within this pathway. 
That means that more cyclic AMP is produced than G proteins are activated. After a period of time, the G protein hydrolase will cause the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP and inactivate the G protein. At this point, the G protein will associate with the gamma and beta subunits, reforming its inactive state. Another glucagon signaling event will be required to reactivate the process. The cyclic AMP produced in the process serves as a second messenger in the process and activates a myriad of downstream targets. We will focus on two targets. The first is protein kinase A. It becomes activated upon binding with cyclic AMP. The second target is a cyclic AMP response element binding protein called CREB. The CREB protein is also activated when bound to the cyclic AMP molecule. This causes the CREB protein to translocate from the cytosol into the mitochondria and into the nucleus. In both of these locations, the activated CREB binds to specific response element sequences within the DNA and activates the transcription of genes that are involved in gluconeogenesis. We will discuss these genes and their encoded proteins in more detail in a later chapter. What's important to note now is that glucagon signaling in the liver results the upregulation of glucose production de novo from non-carbohydrate precursors. This is not a favored pathway in the body. It's expensive energetically for the liver to manufacture glucose. In fact, more expensive in the cost of ATP than can be produced from the newly formed molecule. However, organs like the brain can only utilize free glucose as an energy resource. Thus, the liver will engage in this energy deficit to build glucose for use by the brain and other cellular targets. The liver is quite a selfless organ. Glucagon signaling will also lead to the downregulation of glycolysis, which we will cover later, and glycogenesis, which we will cover now. It also leads to an increase in glycogenolysis, or the breakdown of glycogen, which we will also look at in more depth here. As seen in the previous section, glycogen synthase is the primary enzyme regulated in the biosynthesis of glycogen. And glycogen synthase is active in the dephosphorylated state. Thus, one action of protein kinase A is to phosphorylate the glycogen synthase enzyme, causing it to shift into its inactive conformation and blocking glycogenesis. In addition, activated protein kinase A also phosphorylates the protein phosphatase 1 enzyme, leading to the inactivation of the protein phosphatase 1 enzyme. This helps to maintain the glycogen synthase in the phosphorylated inactive state. The inhibition of protein phosphatase 1, PP1, is a little bit more complicated than indicated on the previous slide. PP1 contains a regulatory domain and a catalytic domain. Normally, the regulatory domain of PP1 binds with glycogen, keeping the molecule close to the location where glycogen synthase will be present. Thus, when glycogen synthase is near its substrate, it can also bind with protein phosphatase 1 and be dephosphorylated into its active state. This is more efficient than having to diffuse around the cell trying to find the PP1 protein randomly. When protein kinase A phosphorylates the regulatory domain of PP1, it dissociates from the catalytic domain, causing the catalytic domain to float away from the glycogen molecule. This makes PP1 less efficient 
at dephosphorylating glycogen synthase because it's harder for the molecules to randomly come into contact with one another. Thus, PP1 is less active. Protein kinase A reduces this activity even further by phosphorylating an inhibitor of PP1. In the phosphorylated state, the inhibitor can bind to PP1, fully inactivating the phosphatase. Both phosphorylation events need to be reversed for PP1 to regain activity. In summary, glucagon signaling in the liver downregulated glycogenesis through the activation of protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylated glycogen synthase directly, inactivating the enzyme, and maintains it in the inactive state by inhibiting the protein phosphatase 1 responsible for dephosphorylating glycogen synthase.